Hey everyone, it's Kai and Lafayette, and this is The, the Theory, Theory of, of Living. Living. Thanks for tuning in. We are able to bring you this episode thanks to our Patreon members. Patreon is a subscription-based platform where people can provide support for content creators like us. Thanks to our Patreon members and supporters, we are able to provide free content on the podcast and weekly episodes. By being a Patreon member, you'll have access to our entire podcast library, full video and audio episodes, along with much more. If you like this episode and you feel it adds value to your life, or you hate it, please subscribe on Patreon and or leave your review on Apple Podcast. And don't forget to mention it to your friends over your next beer. Truly, thank you again, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. And a one, <laughs> and a two, and a three, and we're back. Yes. Episode 17. 17? How crazy is that? That's nonsense. Mm-hmm. If yeah. you're listening to this right now, we're yeah. either dead or we're in Thailand. Yes. It can be neither. Wait, it can't be neither? No. It's one or the other. Yeah. Or we somehow failed our COVID test and mm-hmm. we're still in Arizona. But yeah. today's topic is divorce, which yeah. is pretty poignant considering we're divorcing the U.S. to go to Thailand. Is that yes. what we're doing? Uh, I think so. Uh, k- kind of, right? Um, well, because we're going there with one-way ticket, right? We don't have any plan to return. None. None at all. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean that we're going to stay in Thailand forever. Um, no. But our plan is currently to stay there as long as we can and then visit all the adjacent countries. Well, not all of them, but at least the countries that we find in, find interesting. And um, you know, even to Europe, you know, all the European countries. Yeah. So yeah. this is just one small leg in mm-hmm. a hopefully long and never-ending journey of at least exploration. Right. And it's going to be geographically, of course, but the exciting thing is all the cultures that we're going to touch and interface with, and we'll probably get a new slice of reality that we've never yeah. had before. Mm-hmm. But I guess to get back onto topic, mm-hmm. part of the reason we wanted to touch on divorce today is it's something you've personally been through. Yeah. Uh, well, I also, we've uh, talked to several of our friends who are going through a divorce or considering divorce, and uh, that really made us think of, uh, you know, all the things about divorce, right? And then I, I went through it myself. So, um, and also, wasn't it the case that after COVID, uh, divorce rate increased? I, I don't know. I'm off pretty top sure of my that was head, the case. In, I'd imagine yeah. there was a lot more cases of separation. Right. Abuse probably went up just because you're spending so much amount of time with people without right. having an outlet to regulate your emotion. Yeah. It's probably easy to take out on your partner or family or, you know, it's going to yep. bring to surface a lot of problems that didn't exist purely because you didn't spend that much time together. Exactly. Right. And that's something we seem to run into in a lot of situations mm-hmm. where we have a different expectation mm-hmm. than reality puts upon us. Yeah. You know, for example, this person when I'm dating them mm-hmm. and spending limited weekend time with them or my evenings in some capacity, they're great. They're wonderful. They're amazing. You just want to spend all your time with them. But for whatever reason, when you shift right. into the place of spending copious amounts of time all your free time with this person and if you don't have balance you can find that wow actually this isn't what i thought it was going to be or it's not as wonderful as previously imagined right and sometimes the opposite occurs of course Mm -hmm. that occurs but i find the latter seems to occur more often of course that's anecdotally speaking that's just from my experience of what i've seen friends go through and other people that i know yeah but it brings to mind an important question when you're in a relationship, especially one mm. that's marriage, right? So it's, yeah. there's a heavier liability. There's a heavier expectation of you. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got finances tied together. Your families probably know each other. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of societal pressure on you to maintain yeah. the relationship. And all these things can ultimately lead you being trapped into a marriage that is yeah. not serving you or your partner. Sorry. I think... We find ourselves in this situation more times than not, which is why the divorce rate is currently above 50%, at least in the U.S. But I do think we're slowly shifting out of this place where instead of seeing divorce as this negative thing or 
a yeah. marriage that has failed, mm-hmm. it's maybe realizing more and more that maybe relationships don't need to be defined in this category and mm-hmm. this kind of never ending thing where there's no room to growth. Um, cause typically when we think of marriage, at least here in the U S right. a lot of people still maintain a traditional idea surrounding it mm-hmm. and they smuggle in a lot of the concepts that go hand in hand with traditional relationships, you know, whether that's monogamy or specific gender roles, mm-hmm. um, you know, the man being the breadwinner, the woman raising the children or staying at home, numerous different variations. And when you're forced to fit in this box, I think a lot of people realize, wow, I, this box isn't for me. I don't fit very well into it. And it's very hard because then you realize I'm unhappy. And it's easy to just say, I'm unhappy because I'm married or I'm unhappy because I'm married to this person. Yeah. When really it might be just you're unhappy because you're trying to fit in a box you just can't fit in. Mm Mm-hmm. Like we talk about all the time, we've yeah. absorbed these embedded values. I guess that you can't absorb something that's embedded, but we live in a society that forces the value system mm-hmm. upon us, and we never really take the time to evaluate if this was the value system for us. Yeah. And then you also have taken consideration your partner. You know, do they have the same values? Did they choose the values, or they've just adapted them? Mm-hmm. And this can be hard. It leads to a lot of miscommunication. Yeah. Miscommunication in a way we're even aware that I had a disinterest or a dislike for a specific thing in that value system. You don't mm-hmm. know how to communicate it to the other person. You just yeah. feel not content or happy or any other varying ways to describe that sensation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, it's, it's the um, discontent largely uh, comes from the misunderstanding or... Um, the resulting conflict with the ideas that you had never um, established for yourself. Like marriage is one of the, I think, one of the closest classic examples of imposed ideas because everybody does it, right? Therefore, you don't feel um, fit in a society if you don't. I mean, pretty much universal, right? Yeah. Almost anywhere you go, marriage is very, um, you know, um, culturally accepted, yeah, I guess, or um, expected. It's a custom, right? Yeah. So, a lot of times, um, I think the reason a lot of people fail marriage is that they don't really. Um, and marriage wasn't largely their their you know own value. To begin with, yeah, you know, I, I'm not, you know, really excluding all the conflicts and uh, difficulties that come with marriage, which could be a contributor to uh, breakage of marriage, but also I think it largely comes from the um, leaving the values that they were not yours in the first place, mm. and I think that's why people should be very careful with who they're getting married with and even marriage is an option for them right yeah because i've talked to a lot of people who have um told me that they are not they don't think they're compatible with the system of marriage you know mm-hmm. uh and for them that that value system is completely justifiable and who who's to judge them for not getting married right i mean it's yeah. just one way of living it's true um, I think, unfortunately, we've run into a situation where we think that just by avoiding this agreement with somebody that we're going to avoid the hurt and the pain. So, I mean, I can speak to this. Even though I've never been married, I've been in very heavy relationships where, you know, sharing finances, things of that nature. Right. Where, for all intents and purposes, outside of the legality, of course, Mm -hmm. we were married. Yeah. Families knew each other. Right. You know, we lived in such a way that it seemed we were married, the way mm-hmm. we behaved, living together, and all those things. And we thought, well, you know, at least I think I thought somewhat to a degree, if I'm not married, then I can at least avoid the risk of being hurt. You know, I kind of withheld myself in some regards or some mm-hmm. aspects, mm-hmm. maybe intellectually, yeah. to try to distance myself from the potential of getting hurt. Yeah. And <laughs> surprise, surprise, at the end of the day, I still ended up getting severely hurt granted yeah. a lot of it by my own design mm-hmm. you know by reacting poorly and making poor choices you know in mm-hmm. this situation it was a one-night stand something i'd never done before 
immediately owned up to it, yeah. but realized how much of my life was absolutely this thing where I was just living with these imposed values and the ideas about what yeah. this relationship should look like, yeah. the direction it heads in. And rather than mm-hmm. be able to confront myself and mm-hmm. my value system, what I want out of life, I react it, you know? Right. So you react in a way that can be very poor. Yeah. And then you can hurt somebody. And I think our culture, specifically young people, think mm-hmm. they can avoid hurt and pain in relationships by just not labeling them. Yeah. But that's not what causes the pain in the first place. Getting mm-hmm. married is not what hurts you. It's the lack of your values, understanding them, mm-hmm. and be able to effectively communicate them with your partner. Yeah. So you can be in agreement. So you can navigate this reality together. Yeah. That's unavoidable. You right. have to do the work to find those things. Otherwise, no matter yeah. what relationship, friendship, marriage, business partner, mm-hmm. whatever it is, coworkers, you're always going to be butting heads essentially from miscommunicating. Yeah. You know, whether it's your value doesn't align with theirs. Right. Or you don't even know where your value lies. So you always yeah. feel like you're bouncing off exactly. the walls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's important to, you know, come up with or having that established set of values for your own. And the other person has to um, do the same, right? And then that's the starting point. Even even so, you will still have conflicts. You'll still have, you know, difficulties. Mm-hmm. But that's way better because you know that what your each other's value is, right? Yeah. Then it's all, all you have to do is really, you know, I mean, comparably speaking, all you have to really do is to really communicate your values and try to judge if, if it's possible, if possible, right? I mean, so certain values are not... You know, um, you know, all for change, right? Yeah. Certain values are not, but um, I mean, that's the least starting point. To yeah, me, the bare know? minimum, right? Yeah, bare, that's the that's the bare minimum. And again, guys, yeah. when we're talking about this, you maybe you're in a relationship right now, maybe yeah. you're married right now. Mm-hmm. You can begin this assessment currently, yeah, right now, exactly. with your partner. It's mm-hmm. not like because you didn't arrive to this conclusion from the get go mm-hmm. that you're always going to be at odds with your partner right. or you have to break this relationship and start over. Yeah. That's not what we're saying. Definitely don't have to do yeah. that. Mm-hmm. It's just, you're going to probably have to compromise yeah. and again, compromise is not a bad thing in this situation to realize, to maintain this love with this person, we have mm-hmm. to be able to identify our values yeah. and where we have the issues, you know, mm-hmm. where do we not see eye to eye? Yeah. And then you have to have, this is part of what love is, mm-hmm. bend your will to a degree right. to try to understand their reality and their yeah. point of view and they behave accordingly. Yeah, yeah. again, it's not going to be this 100% sacrifice thing. Mm-hmm. It might be on some issues. Maybe you have to give completely in on some yeah. issues. Mm-hmm. But again, that's part of compromise. Compromise doesn't necessarily reflect this 50-50. Mm-hmm. Like we do it your way this time, we do it my way next time. That's, you know, again, a little bit too binary. It's going to be different. Yeah. For some people that might be the method of operation you choose to pursue to have right. success in your relationship. Yeah. But maybe you can talk about this maybe a little more from your life experience. Mm-hmm. What is it that, I guess, in the first place led you to get married? Because you married an American woman. You were living in Korea. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it was... Um, the, the marriage seemed to be the, the right next move, you know, because I loved her so much. She loved me so much. Uh, even though the dating itself wasn't um, the most smooth uh, course, because we met together, uh, met at first, and um, I broke up with her almost after a week or so, because at the time, I really didn't... My English was pretty short, and, uh, well, because I grew up in Korea. How old were you at this point, by the way? For the listeners, I know, but... Uh, I was... uh, I was 24 when I met her. Yeah. So you you weren't uh, you weren't a kid. I mean, 24 is young, but not a yeah, kid. Yeah. That was right after the military. Uh, almost right after I met her at a bar. We had a great time, <laughs> and uh, she wanted she wanted to date, and I said, "Yeah, sure." That was my first time dating a foreign girl or you know whoever that is not Korean. And after a week or so, I strongly thought that okay this is not going to work out because i we can't even communicate you know so i broke up with her and she seemed really cool about it (laughs) and um next time i met her at the same bar uh, maybe after a month or so um she was cool 
right? So, okay, uh, this is how like American girls react, I guess. That's kind of cool. How they handle the breakup. You yeah, felt like she was exactly. handling it with like... Yeah, pretty well. Yeah. yeah. But then after a couple of hours, she came to me a little tipsy. Um, oh, God, here we go. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but she wanted to uh, get back together. So after hours of talk, I was convinced. Uh, we started dating again. And I think we broke up one more time after that. But then we got back together again and dated for about two years and then we married. Wow. Yeah. And then you ended up coming to the U.S. through that marriage, correct? Yeah. Uh, after a year and a half, uh, that was not the plan at first. We were teaching at the time um, at the same school. But then she was really homesick badly because she wanted to come back. And um, it was a you know big move for me because I hadn't... I. I I was born and raised in Korea. I didn't yeah. know anything about America other than things I learned from movies or TV shows, just like anybody. So I had that, you know, fantasy about America, but also at the same time, I was very, um, I was nervous, and you know, I didn't want to go come because I had, I had all my friends there, yeah. families there, but then I just couldn't watch that anymore. That she was suffering. Yeah. Uh, from homesick. That's hard. I mean, so you had to compromise, right? Yeah. I mean, any of you who has suffered homesick before can understand, you know, what it is like. It's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. I've never experienced it. I sometimes miss Korea, but I've never experienced severe homesick. I'm not the kind of person. Not saying, not to say that those <laughs> people who suffer uh, homesick is weak. It's just that uh, we all have different uh, characteristics. And sure. I, I, I was born... As the first son of the first son, who was very uh, spoiled, but I um, left home pretty early compared yeah. to other guys, and then um, became independent and sort of disconnected the connection with my family. So there is no really home for me. That's yeah. what I'm getting at. I, I yeah. don't really have strong place that I, I want to call home. Geographically speaking, right? Yes. So I do not, I haven't really experienced homesick other than like the desire to um, go back so that I can see my friends, you yeah, know, yeah. things like that. Foods, just, just minor things. It's never severe. Yeah. But anyway, I couldn't just watch that anymore um, because I loved her. So we came here in 2008 and... I went back to school and um, almost right after school, um, I got a job. We uh, moved to Austin, but she wasn't really happy with our marriage. That's where I met you at that job, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, the first time when we hung out, she texted me she wants divorce. <laughs> I remember. We talked about it on the first episode, I think. We did, yeah. Blind Pig Pub. We were outside yeah. smoking a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, my wife just texted me that she wanted a divorce. Yeah. And I just remember turning and looking at you. Know, I like, want to hear your version of it because I remember exactly what happened, but I, I want to know like your perspective. I'm so, sure that there are things that you haven't told me. I remember we. I remember exactly where yeah. we parked, mm -hmm. like back in that big empty lot mm -hmm. downtown. Yeah. And then we walked. We walked pretty far, actually. That was a pretty far place to yeah. park. Well, we did. We did yeah. that so many times. I know so. so many times. It was great. But yeah, I remember we went there. You know, we were probably. I think we were only on our first, first or second drink. I mean, it was yeah. pretty early in the night. Maybe like nine thirty. <laughs> maybe still fresh. Yeah. 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 You know, recently dark, mm -hmm. not too late. Smoking a cigarette, and he said, "Oh, my wife just texted me saying she wanted a divorce." I remember just thinking, "Yeah, you okay?" You good? Mm -hmm. and you just kind of were like a stoic response about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, man, this guy cannot be okay. Yeah. Like, as much as you're outwardly just playing you're okay, right. I was like, man, what are the chances? But I also felt incredibly grateful that, mm -hmm. you know, it's our first time hanging out outside of work. Yeah. And at least you're getting, like, bad news in a relatively kind of, like, distracting situation. Yeah. You know, like, I couldn't imagine getting that text alone on a saturday night in my apartment mm -hmm. that would be miserable absolutely miserable mm -hmm. but i mean you you didn't seem surprised in any regard you just kind yeah. of shrugged it off continued forward and it, i mean we enjoyed the night and talked a lot yeah 
but to me it was not a man who was experiencing shock or something surprising right to me it was very apparent that there was a lot of issues and things leading up to that moment Mm -hmm. otherwise there's no way you would have handled it yeah that way such like uh poise i guess yeah (laughs) <laughs> well, that or I would think like this dude's a sociopath I'm, I'm pretty good at it I don't know if it's a good or bad but uh, I don't well I show my emotion pretty easily uh, but I'm quite indifferent about things that other people consider shocking yeah you know well just because I uh, I've grown to learn that life is full of events that are out of your control you know so i i for me the most important thing is not you know getting shocked but the most important thing is how to handle it you mm-hmm. know that's how uh i approach problems when yeah. i see problems i don't talk about yes i'm frustrated sometimes i i show my emotion that way but i immediately uh have a tendency to immediately focus on uh, solutions rather than you know just complaining about the problem itself yeah, yeah that's just my characteristic part of it is that but also part of the other part is you're you're right that um i saw that coming i saw that coming i was just disappointed that like that was done via text yeah you know because she was uh, abroad at the time she could have called me you know that would have been better i mean i'm not saying i would have uh reacted in a different way but i think is that's just more courteous yeah you know yeah i mean there's no easy way to yeah pull the plug so to speak with anybody Mm -hmm. but i i don't want to speak any you know badly about her um because i mean marriage is is uh two ways right i mean it's not that i was a good guy and she was a bad person therefore we divorced it's not like that you know there were a lot of problems. We're young. I mean, I okay. So that's what what I should probably I should talk about because I was young. I was twenty. We were married. I was like twenty five, something like that. Wow, that's a long time years ago. ago. Yeah. And she was young. She was two years younger than me. So we're really young, man. And at the time, I, I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do with, with my life or I didn't have strong values in my life. Uh, I just reacted. I lived in a way that I just, you know, react to things, you know. Mm-hmm. I think it's, yeah. this is the, one of the downsides about being younger. Mm. Just because you have less experience yeah. with situations, you're typically more prone to extreme reaction. Yeah. Right? Or, the feeling's so new, you don't really know how to handle it. So you mm-hmm. kind of like respond maybe over the top or maybe too little just because it's like your first time dealing with it. Yeah. You know, something of this nature. Like you've yeah. already had your hardships, but that's like the beautiful thing about as you get older, mm-hmm. you run into more of these situ. If you're the type of person to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, you become familiar with them. Yeah. You at least know how to handle, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, if I blow my mind, lose my right. crap then it's probably going to be negative. Yeah. They're probably going to respond poorly. I'm going to feel stupid because I didn't control myself. Yeah. And again, there's a time and a place to like let loose yeah. of your emotion for sure. Yeah. But that is for sure one of the hardest parts for anybody. Like you mm-hmm. guys are both still growing very much into who you are. Right. You know, like you're a way different man today than you were when I first met you. Yeah. Like your core values are still the same. But as far as how you handle things and, like, navigate the world Mm -hmm. is definitely different. Oh, really? I think so, yeah, Mm. for sure. Yeah, I mean, I I like to think that that's the case because otherwise, what's the point of (laughs) getting old, right? (laughs) Let me tell you, man, you're none the wiser, (laughs) if anything. (laughs) Yeah, we talked about it earlier when we're drinking. Um, Well, by the way, it's uh, 5.47 right now. Okay. When I said we... We're drinking all here. We're talking we had about a drink <laughs> at, at dinner. We had to drink a yeah. dinner. Yeah. I was just making fun of this. <laughs> but um, we talked about it earlier. There's a difference between intelligence and wisdom, right? And wisdom usually has the, um, it comes from experiences. It has nothing to do with your IQ. It has nothing to do with what you learn from books 
or from stories from someone else. It has nothing to do with it. Wisdom is strongly associated with experiences. Yeah. Right? And um, in that sense, typically when you age, you get wiser too. Not all people, obviously, because not all people make good decisions about their uh, experiences. Yeah. And, you know, but anyway. Well, there's only a wisdom that can come from Mm -hmm. falling on your face. Yeah. You know? And the realization that that was the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. And you can gain something very valuable by making poor choices. Yeah. Again, that can only come from, though, once you have the ability to realize that was a poor choice. Mm -hmm. If you live in denial, you never become wise. Yeah. And you repeat, unfortunately, the same things over Mm -hmm. and over. And again, you know, I don't think, like we've mentioned earlier, this isn't a relationships are not a zero one thing they're not bad mm. binary in that regard where they're yeah. all good or all bad yeah i mean i'm sure there's outliers that that is 100 percent the case for yeah but most of the time there's really good moments in relationships and there's really bad times yeah and a lot of these things can be circumvented just via discussion yeah and if we were start removing the stigma attached to divorce, mm-hmm. I think, societally speaking, we can be better off. Because a lot of people are in horrible relationships, mm-hmm. and they're so afraid of the stigma attached to divorce yeah. that they'd rather be in this kind of miserable condition and maintain the status quo mm-hmm. rather than stir it up a bit and maybe risk the marriage. Mm-hmm. Because they would rather be married unhappily right. than suffer all the things attached to divorce. Yeah. And luckily, we live in a time period where divorce is becoming normalized. Yeah. Again, I'm not saying it's lucky that we're having more divorces, Mm -hmm. but at least people are given the option to. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of kids. I know people have these um, situations where you're married, you have children, and you don't want to break up because of the children. Regardless of the age, you're worried about the impact it's going to have on them. But a lot of these kids as well, Mm -hmm. they can sense things, man. They they pick up. Like from a very early age, we're able to pick up on things. Even we're not able to express it or communicate Mm -hmm. it in an intelligent way like an adult would. Mm -hmm. They're they're aware of the power structures and the behaviors. Yeah. You know, and they learn from that. They learn what's acceptable or can learn what's acceptable based on what you allow from your partner. Mm -hmm. You know, if one parent is always sacrificing and giving up, yeah. That child may very well think like that's very normal Mm -hmm. that's okay to live that way and again it may be okay to live that way as long as you're choosing to do that as long as you're actively choosing to make those sacrifices but now you know present day media divorce is normalized a lot Mm -hmm. of parents are split up even in the Mm -hmm. media we watch tvs movies so kids are actually in a position where they can see divorce and then compare it to the media they usually consume right be like oh this isn't that weird like, yeah, they're split up. Right. And I think that's extremely valuable. I will say that's one good thing that the media has done better to represent reality mm-hmm. is that sometimes people just split up and go different ways. Yeah. Not because they hate each other. Yeah. Most of these people don't, like, hate, hate each other. They're yeah. They're just incompatible. Yeah, I mean, th- th- that idea, I mean, obviously we all have different uh, opinions about marriage and divorce, right? But I think, um, I-, I do believe that, if you're in a marriage, if your marriage is going, you know, not great, I think we, I, you should really try hard. You should really try hard. What I mean by that, mean by that is that you really need to uh, try hard to communicate each other and find out when you, when you talked about earlier, hey, maybe one of them or both of them haven't really found out their values. Mm-hmm. I mean, that could be the case or you know whatever. But then, if there is no communication about it, then there's no way to fix it. Yeah. And what I mean by that also is that fixing your marriage is one thing but another thing is the fixing your life right so it all starts with we've been talking about this for a very long time it really starts with evaluation you know if you're going through harsh you know really hard marriage evaluate your life what do you want from your life what do you want to do for your kids if you have kids yeah you know it will all starts with that evaluation but at, at least i agree with you that it, at least that your decision shouldn't be based on your kids alone. Yeah. That if we divorce, I'm going to ruin my kids. I don't think that's the case anymore. I don't yeah. think that's the case anymore because kids have access to abundance of information 
you talked about media, but also they see a lot of things on social media. Mm -hmm. I think they are a lot more wiser than us today <laughs> at, know, at the same I, age. I, I that agree. they understand what divorce is, um, how, you know, how society sees divorce. I mean, they are very sensitive to how we look at things. Yeah. So I don't think that should be the sole reason, at least, um, to avoid divorce. Yeah. No, I mean, I absolutely agree. I yeah. think... Most of the time, unfortunately, is, and again, it's very understandable. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to shit on him, but when I say this, but a lot of people in bad relationships, mm -hmm. specifically marriages with children, are using their kids as an excuse. Yeah. Rather than face or the music or the risk. Or they make kids to, to save their marriage. Some people do that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I. What a crazy yeah. thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Let's add more stress and burdens to this and maybe somehow. Well, not just that. Why are you making your you know kid what what do you put your kid in that situation yeah it's not yeah, very, that's not very fair for them kind, right <laughs> yeah it's, it's kind not of, fair for them at it's all extremely selfish yes you know so anyway fortunately we look at divorce um in a different way than we used to so yeah. that's great yeah so obviously we're not encouraging people to divorce um, like we said, evaluate first and then try hard to fix the marriage. Yeah. Fix, fixing the marriage is almost equal to that fixing your life and fixing your spouse's life. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't be, it should be that way. You're, you're, you're in the same, you're in the same path. Yeah. You're together. Ideally, right? I yeah. mean, that's what any relationship. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a shared part of the path, right? Yeah. And how much you have usually in common mm -hmm. in these things, like, then you share more destinations on the mm -hmm. path. So mm -hmm. you usually spend more time. But that's kind of the cool thing. Yeah. If anybody's listening to this because yeah. divorce is on their mind, you're actually mm -hmm. maybe one step ahead of other people, even in good relationships, because yeah. you're looking at the problems. Mm -hmm. You know, This might be the rare opportunity for you and your partner, your significant other, whoever you're interested in. And again, yeah. this doesn't have to apply to divorce. Maybe you're thinking about breaking up. Maybe you're thinking about taking a break, whatever. You know, you're shifting your relationship dynamics Maybe the thing that's causing a lot of the stress is you don't have a shared goal. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you've checked the box. Maybe you've got the kids. Maybe you've got the, yeah, the car, house, the house, all yeah. that. You Maybe you've got all those things, and now you're feeling empty. Yeah. But now you can come back to the table with this person you love. Right. And maybe you don't love them right now, but you for mm -hmm. sure love them at one point, hopefully. And now maybe it's like, what? what's our next plan? Like, what are we doing? What are we yeah. trying to achieve? Yeah. And you can build something together. Because yeah. then a lot of those smaller things fall away. I mean, even like what we do, you know, there's ways we interact and handle certain aspects of the podcast or business that would be different. Mm -hmm. But because we have a shared goal, yeah, there's more freedom. Like, right. oh, we're trying to achieve the same goal. Execute however you want. Yeah. I trust you. Right. You know what I mean? Like, once I know we're on the same path and mm -hmm. we're after the same goal, yeah, like some things I might need elaboration on. But for right. the most part, I understand because I yeah. know you're intentionally intentionally pursuing that mm -hmm. and when we can pursue it together right all that other small stuff man it just becomes yeah. noise you're like yeah it's fine it's yeah. whatever yeah that's that's really important i think everybody should have at least one core value or one very specific goal for their life at least right i think that's the bare minimum yeah you know it could be as crazy as i want to be like a cunt Mm. Or as a small as I want to be a great uh, an engineer, whatever. I mean, there. But everybody should have at least one goal in their life, right? And in terms of uh, displaying that uh, in your marriage, or in, uh, well, you're less limited in, in into marriage instead of just relationship, because we're talking about divorce today. Like you said, if you know your core core value, and if you know your spouse's core value. You understand whether or not you you guys are compatible, right? Yeah. I mean, I I can compromise a lot of things that are small that are not important to me because I love that person so much. Yeah. But I have certain values that I cannot compromise, right? Yeah. So you should understand that first between, you know, two people. Yeah. But once you're in a marriage and you understand each other's goals and purpose in life, it's a lot easier to navigate yeah. because you know where you're going. Yeah, and a lot yeah. of those values that you're referring to, you know, for the layman, those are mm. boundaries. That's what we call boundaries. Yeah. You know, typically the boundary is a value system you don't cross, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes they can be 
more specific. So, like for example, maybe one of my values is mm-hmm. cleanliness or discipline surrounding cleanliness. Yeah. You know, there's so many ways that can be executed. So, if I know that's my value, one of my core values, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to communicate that to my partner, I could say, you know, I don't like dishes being left in the sink mm-hmm. because my core value is cleanliness and tied yeah. to that. And I just can't live with somebody. Yeah. You know, that does that. And then yeah. that other person, it, then they're given a choice. By sharing your vulnerabilities yeah. and your boundaries, you actually enable people to be free because right. you're giving them an option and a choice right. to engage rather than just act and then you're reacting and they feel mm-hmm. like, what? why is this person doing this? You know, it's yeah. kind of unfair right. to punish somebody when they didn't even know from the get-go. Yeah. I think a lot of the thing, though, is like most of us don't take the time to sit down and find out what this is. Yeah. So we end up, you know, six years into a relationship, married and all this stuff. And we've actually never even done that first step. Right. We've just been pretty much, mm-hmm. you know, for lack of a better term, stumbling through life mm-hmm. and reacting to everything and hoping things go the way we want them to. Yeah. yeah. And we, why would you ever put that amount of chance on something you value so extreme? Like mm-hmm. like marriage. You probably value marriage highly if you're getting married. Yeah. So you'd want to try to move as many variables as possible mm-hmm. to be successful or know how to operate. Right. And unfortunately, I think we live in a place, and again, this is probably just everywhere in general in a lot of ways, but we're so unaware of those boundaries and communicating our vulnerabilities because mm-hmm. we don't want to be seen as weak, fragile, or yeah. whatever, that we oftentimes set up our partner and ourselves for failure because mm-hmm. we just fail to understand implicitly yeah. or communicate something right. effectively. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of pain and struggle that could be avoided. And again, this communication is more than just a one time thing. Yeah. Because your values will shift. Yeah. Maybe not your core values, but the way in which they uh, perpetuate themselves yeah. will. You know, so maybe cleanliness is my core value. And maybe it's, you know, so many dishes mm-hmm. in the sink. But maybe their core value is different. They they're like, I can't be tidy all the time. So mm-hmm. you allow a plate or two plates. You know, you find these ha- happy mediums. Yeah. They shift because you engage with this person more right. and they have an impact on your values. Yeah. And that's the cool thing because together, your partner, you guys start creating your own value system. Mm-hmm. And then you guys start living in that way together. Exactly. Exactly. That's That should be the ideal course, right? Because no matter how similar your upbringings are, where you grew up, your culture, still two individuals will have very different, you know, a lot of differences, yeah. right? So given that those two people have um, established core systems, core value systems, from that point, you know, the marriage should be the course during which both people, you know, try to adjust their, you know, ways to live together, make the optimal conditions yeah. for, for each other, right? And when you talked about cleanliness, I mean, I can really <laughs> relate to it because I've uh, dated not just, you know, I'm not talking about any particular person here, but I've dated a lot of you know girls who are messy. Um, you got to be a lot more specific than that. Like when you when you say that, OK, I do. I really can handle messiness. This doesn't really convey. <laughs> it's not really. um convincible too generic right too generic you have to be very very specific for example i can say that for for myself i can say that uh when i say i can really handle messiness what i mean by that is that i ruin my day i can't have productivity i can't focus i just can't have my day i have to get out of the house yeah how miserable that sounds like right a person (sighs) who can be in their house right yeah (laughs) Their home is like offensive to them, right? You know? So, I think it's really helpful to um, talk about specifics of what you're, you know, asking for, yes. rather than just generic statement. Yeah. Then the other person has really hard time understand you. Like, what do you mean? Like, why can't you? Because I can, right? Because we're two different people. Yeah. The other person may be very, you know, be able to thrive in in mess. Yeah. Right, but some people just can't. Yeah, right? then you also run into the problem of definition messiness. Yeah. Messiness for you is going to be different exactly. than... Exactly. I've mm-hmm. had the same situation, you know, dating somebody that has... We're using the same words to right. describe something, but the actual definition is incredibly mm-hmm. different. You know, messiness for somebody might be like total mm-hmm. freaking chaos. Yeah. They're like, outside of that, that's not messy. Mm-hmm. Whereas for somebody like you or myself, where mm-hmm. 
just a couple dishes in the sink that's messy like yeah come on like what are we doing here right and again if you don't actually effectively communicate this to somebody Mm -hmm. and then you harp on them or punish them yeah that's pretty mean you know it's unfair um so it's super important again like to communicate this in effective ways and -hmm. the other problem with language to get into this again when we're communicating things is that the connotation of a word Mm -hmm. when i say messiness there's a negative connotation attached to it so people <clears throat> inherently mm-hmm. will say, I don't yeah. like messiness. Yeah. How can you like something that has a negative connotation? People don't. Otherwise, mm-hmm. they wouldn't have the negative connotation. <laughs> exactly. So everybody, right. almost by definition, right. doesn't like messiness. Yeah. But what so, that means, <laughs> so varied. Yeah, I, I think this is going into like uh, effective communication course, <laughs> but it's not. I mean, the communication, we're, you know, talking about this for a long time because you see important right but again you're you're you're, you made a really good point i mean yes you you need to be specific when you when you communicate about certain things but also another thing is that it's important to choose right words yeah right i mean it's all about communicate more effectively not to piss each other yeah right i mean that's not what we're trying to do but a lot of times we do that right because we're mad we're frustrated you know, the first time, the first couple of times you, you talk to her or talk to him really nicely, but it's not getting fixed. Yeah. So you just get emotional, right? So you just intentionally choose bad words, intentionally choose offensive words, right? To just make the other person mad. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. Then what does that do? Maybe that person will be fine after 10 minutes, right? But that's not going to. That's not that's not gonna go away, yeah. right? It's, it accumulates, yeah. right, and then explodes one day. Yeah. Well, what I'm convinced yeah. too, when we're trying to make the other person angry or mm-hmm. you know whatever emotion, typically it's because we're feeling that emotion, mm-hmm. and we want the other person to understand us. Yeah. Even in this very primordial, I don't know if I'm using that word correctly in this regard, but in this primal sense. Like, I can't get the words across to you. Mm-hmm. I could probably convey the emotion by pissing you off that yeah. I'm pissed off. So yeah. I'm going to make you pissed off. Yeah. When realizing we can do that without the emotional aspect. Right. We can just use our words to prevent the emotional feelings. Yeah. Because they're so intense. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people aren't earnestly believe that you don't make a choice emotionally. Mm-hmm. But as you start to develop, like... I guess a responsiveness routine mm-hmm. and you take time to decide how you're going to respond emotionally to things, yeah. you start to realize like emotions are not reactionary to a degree. Like yeah. there's some time between like they said this, I feel pissed off. I'm not going to react mm-hmm. in a pissed way. Right. Yeah. There's actually a delay, but it's something you have to train mm-hmm. because language is just a, a form of communication, right? Yeah. Just like emotions are. Just language is a much more complex form yeah. of communication. So it's something we have to actively get better at all the time. And my one b- good buddy, Brendan, who you know, mm-hmm. he has this, I mean, I'm, he got it from somebody else, I'm sure, because it's probably pretty popular, but it's called HALT, mm-hmm. H-A-L-T. So if you're hungry, you're angry, you're lonely, or you're tired, mm-hmm. don't engage with somebody. Mm-hmm. Until you got all those covered, because you might be responding from one of those places. Yeah, you know, you're not actually communicating yourself intellectually. Mm-hmm. You're communicating these more emotional states. Yeah, and that's what a lot of things we run into is like we're not lo- we're no longer communicating concepts. I'm just trying to communicate my emotional state to you, mm-hmm. and that's hard. Yeah. It's hard to do that because right. you get upset, you get sad, you get angry, and they're so intense feeling. Yeah. They oftentimes lead to these big fights, big blowouts, mm-hmm. or huge displays that are just not manageable long term for a relationship to be successful. Yeah. You can't have these huge ups and downs and roller coasters forever. Eventually somebody's mm-hmm. gonna be like, This is insane. Yeah. My body can't handle this. I'm stressed. <laughs> you know, right. This is this is an absurd way of living. Which brings us right back to like you yeah. gotta communicate. Right. And again, talking about divorce. It's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. You finally realized you've reached the point where, oh man, I think you and I are not compatible. Yeah. But maybe you don't know why you're not compatible. Maybe yeah. it's only because you're responding to strong emotional states. So now you can at least have the conversation. Mm-hmm. And you know, for most people, if you're in a relationship, you've reached the point where you want divorce. 
you're probably not in a condition where you can effectively communicate to each other anymore. Mm-hmm. So a third party, third party, like a therapist who doesn't mm-hmm. know either of you, yeah, that can hear you both mm-hmm. unbiasedly and then give some feedback yeah. in order how to set boundaries, respect each other, and effectively communicate can be yeah. an extremely valuable tool. Yeah, because you got to be honest. At some point, if you're far enough down the road, mm-hmm. you need a helping hand, a rope out. You yeah. need somebody else to help guide you because you're just you're too far in it and there's nothing shameful about that there's nothing wrong i've gone to therapy you've gone to therapy you know yeah Mm. there's a part of it that absolutely is i would say the majority of it is like i'm trying to fix myself in a way or understand myself better Mm. and how to communicate my ideas and this other person whether it's a book a therapist Mm. whatever is just helping me and enabling me to more effectively communicate yeah but what a wonderful thing Finally, at least you can do something about it. You don't have to remain in this stagnant state. Mm-hmm. Things can change. Yeah, That might mean separation. Yeah. But that might be the best thing for you, your partner, mm-hmm. potentially your kids, your friends. Yeah, So you guys can live more fulfilling lives, even if that's in the absence of one another. Mm-hmm. Or maybe the capacity of the relationship shifts. The dynamic changes. Mm-hmm. You know, Maybe you have to spend more time apart. Maybe you're not spending enough time together. Right. There's an infinite ways this could manifest, but if you don't have the conversation, you and I are just doing guesswork. You know, yeah. we're just throwing ideas. This is, yeah, we're not talking about anybody in particular. It's horrible. Yeah, horrible. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, we talked about. Um, I think on the episode of dating or relationship, one of them, we talked about uh, briefly the movie Marriage Story, right? Oh, yeah. I think. I mean, it was a great movie, but one of a lot of things that speak spoke to me was that. Toward the end, they showed a lot of scenes where they love each other still. Yeah. They love each other so much. Yeah. Um, we really don't, a lot of people don't divorce because they hate each other, right? I mean, they still love each other, but they just realize that it can just continue, Yeah. right? So, um, again, I, I think we should probably summarize what we've been talking about because I really want this to be, I mean, we're not experts or anything, but... Through this conversation, I uh, want people who are listening to this, find some values, right? Yeah. Find something that's helpful because I'm sure a lot of people are going through divorce at this moment, very moment, yeah. right? And having difficulties in relationships. But um, we really should start with a good evaluation of your life and your spouse's life and what you guys want together yeah. in a marriage, uh, whether that's kid or house, whatever that is. And then go from there um, through good communications, yeah. continuous evaluations, communications. And um, if still there's no way for us to, I mean, not us, uh, for you guys to be together, then, you know, I would say that try try the hardest you can. Yeah. And then uh, make, make a decision. You know, don't make any premature decision. Because you feel just miserable. Because yeah. I've been there. It feels just miserable. Like you don't want to, you don't want to go home. You know, um, it's just horrible life. But that shouldn't really make force you to make good decisions so quickly. Because just think about it. You, I mean, not all couples are like that. But most people married because they love the other person so much, yeah. right? I mean, just think about the moment that you decided that you want to marry that person, right? I mean, one of the greatest feelings, right? You, you're so sure that you can be with that person for the rest of your life, but you've come to this point. Yeah. So don't make any premature uh, decision without um, trying hard. Yeah. And again, maybe you're one of those people who actually doesn't share the feeling yeah. that you have in the sense of maybe you didn't feel a strong movement to be yeah. with this person romantically. Yeah. That's not to say they're going to be a bad partner. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's time to rekindle the love, the romance. Maybe you don't value romance. Maybe this is purely like a relationship that's based on achieving certain things you want for your life. Yeah. That partner could be great for you. Mm -hmm. But again, you still have to just come to the table, like you said, reevaluate what you want, why you got into this in the first place, Mm -hmm. how you can go forward, and then you have to discuss it with them. Yeah. And you have to try to be understanding of their position as well. Right. Because you're not in this alone. Mm-hmm. 
and there's tons of people outside of your relationship that would love to help you. Mm-hmm. People that don't even know you. There's tons of resources. Um, I think, you know, what I want to say to anybody that's going through a divorce or a shifting of their relationship dynamic is to, you know, do the due diligence to find out where your faults are, mm-hmm. where you've made mistakes. Don't beat yourself up. Mm-hmm. Realize them. Start taking actionable measures to change. Mm-hmm. Resolve them for yourself. Yeah. And for your partner, maybe not even this current partner, maybe your future partner. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't have a future partner just to make your life better overall. Yeah. And just take it one day at a time. This yeah. process doesn't happen overnight. It does for some people, but I would say that's a vast minority. Yeah. So be gentle, be kind, and just think think earnestly. Yeah. Be honest. And you can yeah. arrive to a better conclusion about what the next step looks like, what the next step should be. Yeah. And understand, people get divorced, relationships happen, they end. People also have horrible mm. shit happens in their relationships where they think they're going to get divorced, and they come back tighter than ever, mm. more robust, more loving, mm-hmm. with a deeper relationship than they ever had before. Yeah. But they came to this bridge, and they realized, I got to get to the other side to see what's there. Mm-hmm. Because what I have right now, this is not cutting it. Yeah. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. But your life will be better for it eventually. It may not feel like that for six months, a year, or two years. Yeah. But eventually, hopefully, you'll be able to look back and have gained wisdom yeah. through that experience. That's great. Yeah. Uh, if you guys have any questions about anything, um, especially what we talked about today, uh, leave some comments so that we can answer. But, yeah. um, I mean, today's topic was pretty pretty heavy, right? <laughs> There's nothing funny about it. Yeah. I mean, we could have talked about some funny things. I mean, there are certainly some, you know, funny things about <laughs> divorce it's, and marriage. Definitely <laughs> really there. Well, maybe next time. <laughs> divorce part two. <laughs> the we'll last side of divorce. Talk about, you know, funny things, maybe. <laughs> but um, we just wanted to uh, make this more helpful for a lot of people who are having a hard time right now. Um, but yeah, let us know if you if you guys have any questions. Um, yeah. yeah, you're not in alone. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Bye. That's this week's episode of the Fear of Living Podcast. Thanks for listening with us. You're Lafayette and Kai. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode. And if you'd like to help support us, we have a Patreon page where you can subscribe for exclusive content. Also, please share it with others who you think may find value in our discussion. Leave a rating, a review, and please subscribe to the podcast. Thank you again. See you next time.